First impression. Everyone will be beaten. Everyone will be beaten. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yes. Other impressions? Expectations? Yeah. The other impressions? Strikes you. It's how you feel. I get complacent. I've been scary. I mean, that's what I felt. When I was, I first looked at this passage in preparation for today about two weeks ago, and I read it through, and I thought, ooh, ooh, it's a, it's a bit scary. Now, digging into it, I think it's a bit more than a bit, just a bit scary. There's more to it than that, and, and there is good news in it, because I believe that every passage, every part of the New Testament is part of the gospel, the good news. So there's good news in here. But there's no way around the fact that it is a sobering passage as well. And I think our title of Don't Miss Out perhaps captures it. Have you ever missed out on something you really wish you hadn't? Anybody got something they'd like to share? Anything you missed? You thought, oh, I wish. I wish I had taken that opportunity. Anything like that? Anything you missed out on, Sean? Um, probably my last job I had. I'm not transferring to another place. Moving on and then they want to remind me of five years down the line. Uh, missing out on that job opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, before team camp, Kerry had invited me out to uh, film um, an opening scene for team camp. And uh, that same day, I had just done athletics. I had two lessons of PE in that same day because it was like no, no, no time. I was feeling a bit tired and I didn't know that I was, uh, I was meant to be filming with him. So, I got off home and I said to him, I'm tired, I'm not really feeling going out. Uh, later on, I got to team camp. And this uh, Jordan had done it instead, Jordan was yeah. and uh, he did a great job. And it was it was quite it looked quite cool, and it was all like agent type theme. It was really like down in like this type of styles I want to be when I'm older and things like that. I was a bit like, damn, if only I was Ah, missed out. Well, I, mean, uh, I hope there are further options. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Yeah, Dan? Missed out on the final match, yeah. Oh, okay. Final match. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just going to have to have words with her later. Come on. 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 Very much. Uh, we were living in London in the mid 80s and uh, Queen were playing at Wembley oh. Stadium, the old Wembley Stadium, and I loved Queen and I thought, shall I go? And I did not. Ah, I just thought, that's one of those things I just really wish I hadn't missed out on, you know. Some things, some things matter more than others that we miss out on, right? And even though I'm sad I missed that opportunity to see Queen is not the end of life. Uh, there are some things that are more important not to miss out on, and I think that's what we're looking at today. And let's make sure that we don't miss out on the, uh, on, on the most important things. Um, in this passage, I think it's interesting, let me ask you a couple of other, other questions. Who do you think the master is in this, um, in this passage? Who's the master we're dealing with here? The one coming home to find his servants hopefully ready. And it's a parable, so what do you reckon? It's going to be God, it's going to be Jesus, it's going to be the Messiah, possibly Messiah, we're looking at in the uh, Old Covenant, New Covenant, thinking the servants. Interesting. How, who would you identify as the servants? Thinking about that context, first century. Who would the servants be? The believers? The religious leaders, maybe? Religious leaders, somebody else said something. I said they're believers, people who follow Jesus. Yeah, it could be, could be in that context. Maybe, maybe the religious leaders. I think perhaps Israel as a whole. Israel, because Israel was supposed to be ready for the Messiah to come back. Right? He's coming back to a banquet, which is appropriate. We talked about rejoicing and having some food afterwards. Or he's coming back from a banquet rather. So I think in this context, at least when Jesus is talking, and we're going to have to find the modern day application for ourselves in a minute. Just to put it in its context, I think what Jesus is basically saying here is God promised he would come back to his people. He was hoping to find his people ready. The Messiah has been prophesied. The Messiah has arrived. And what has God found? He 
is people are not ready. In fact, if people are not only not ready, they're not accepting the Messiah who has come. And they're rejecting him. And we see that particularly with the arguments the Pharisees give against Jesus, or we have arguments they have with him, or the teachers of the law, the scribes, and the Pharisees. But nonetheless, Israel as a whole is not accepting the return of the master to the servants in, in this sense. So I don't think he's talking primarily about the second coming. That's the reason I wanted to mention that. Because I think sometimes when we read this passage, it's all about, oh, at some point in the future, Jesus will come back. And yes, there is a time when Jesus will come back. And I think there's, a, there's an application of that to some extent here, but it's not, I don't think it's primarily about that. It's really about, are the people that Jesus is amongst ready to accept him? And therefore, that's the same thing, question for us. Are we now, as people who have the teachings of Jesus, and in, in a sense, uh, whom Jesus is amongst, are we ready to accept him and be ready for him to come into our lives and to be with us? And we'll talk more about that as we, as we go through. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is uh, don't miss the... Don't miss the master. Don't miss the master. I think it's the first part here, this first parable. Uh, there's more than one here. Uh, don't, don't, don't miss out on the master coming. The, the servants are meant to be there keeping their lamps burning. They need to keep their lamps burning because it's hard to light them. They didn't have uh, you know, uh, um, uh, instant lighters uh, or even matches in those days. It's hard to light your lamp. And also, of course, because in those days it was incredibly dark. I mean, no street lighting. Penny and I were sitting upstairs in our upstairs bedroom last night, looking out across uh, towards uh, towards Watford. And of course, uh, over the trees beyond where we live, there's this big glow. There's a glow of light, and it's not the sunset. It's Watford. It's the lights of Watford. The light pollution is quite significant. You you know, you wouldn't have to let, you wouldn't need a lamp to be able to see your your way around the streets of Croxley Green. Or anywhere, I'm sure, where we live, because there's enough ambient light coming out of people's houses and various things to see. But in the first century, you couldn't walk down the street without bumping into something, stubbing your toe, breaking your ankle, because there were potholes and things. You couldn't see them. You needed a lamp. And so to actually even get into his house, the master would need a servant hold of his lamp and say, This way, master, here's the door. Please don't bang your head. Come on in. We've got everything ready for you. It's incredibly dark. And so they need to be ready. Uh, with, their, with their lamps. And I think there's an allusion there to the lamp of the temple. That the temple light was never meant to go out. Right? It was always meant to be a light. And it needed to be tended. And the reason it was meant to be there was so that it was, was ready for the Master, for the Messiah, for God to come back and be amongst his people. That was the idea. Some kind of allusion there. There's an Exodus allusion, I think. Exodus 12, about the Passover. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, the staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. The idea of being ready. The idea for Israel of always being ready for the Messiah was something very deep in their psyche, or at least mentally. Were they ready for him to come back? So they were meant to be poised for action, ready to re receive the Messiah. And it's always good to be ready for whatever's coming up next, isn't it? Um, it's always a problem when we're not quite ready. Penny and I travelled to Edinburgh, to Scotland, in, uh, just between Christmas and New Year. And uh, I, I must admit, you know, if you ask in our family who is the more organised of the two of us, there is no contest. Uh, Penny is super organised, and I'm just grateful I'm married to her. Um, and that works most of the time. But on this occasion, the trip to Scotland was, was sort of my trip. I was asked to go and do some teaching for the Edinburgh and Glasgow churches, and so it was a trip, and Penny was coming along, so I, I was supposed to organise everything, and I did. And I was really proud of myself. I don't know about you, but you're not really an organised person. You get really organised. You get really excited. And I was super I had the routes planned out. I knew where we were going. I had the tickets organised. I had them ahead of time. I bought them. They were in the house. And I put them in a particular place where I knew they would be, so I couldn't lose them, and I was happy. We went to Manchester on the way, we had a, a day with Penny's family celebrating Christmas stuff. And then we repacked our bags, stayed up and I repacked our bags, went to the Manchester uh, Piccadilly station, and uh, went to get on the train. And could I find the train ticket? And, I, and we had two suitcases, we were gone for about a week, I think. So we had two suitcases and backpacks. And, and so, I, but I know I have them. I, I was organised this time. And I know I have them. And I went through all my bags, went through Penny's bags, went through my briefcase could not find those tickets. We missed the train. I went to the Virgin train desk and the lady was wonderful. But she's like, well, we can buy you some new tickets, but it's going to be about 250 pounds. 
said, ah, let me have another look at my bag. <laughs> and she said, look, it's all right, don't take your time, and I'll hold these tickets for you. So I went through my bag, still couldn't find it, went back, trying to work out some other way, how can we get up to Scotland? And she said, go away again. So well, we went away again, and, I looked, and, and eventually, in, in my briefcase, in this briefcase, which I had emptied and searched three times already, I opened the front flap, and there were the tickets. <laughs> All along, right there. I don't know how I'd miss them. And uh, fortunately, we were able to use those and we got on the train and went, went to Scotland and it was alright. But that, that feeling of panic, we've all felt that, right? At those moments of, ooh, I'm going to miss out. I'm messed up when I'm not ready. I think the main message from the first part of this passage is be ready for God when He shows up in your life. Be ready when God shows up in Life. Now, some of us here, we uh, we took advantage of that five years ago, ten years ago, however many years ago. So, some of us here maybe haven't yet taken that opportunity. God showed up in your life. Uh, you've had some things happen that were difficult in your life, some things you didn't expect, uh, tragedy perhaps, or, or emotional difficulty, or maybe um, God's been knocking on your door and you felt it because of answered prayer, or because someone's been talking to you about God. Or because you've been sitting in a church service and thinking about God. God shows up in different ways. In not always the ways we expect. And part of the problem for the Israelites, of course, was that God didn't show up in the way they expected. They were expecting something else from the Messiah. But Jesus wasn't what they expected. And sometimes, church isn't what we expect it to be. And Jesus isn't who we expect. And the Christian life isn't what we expect it to be. And what God is saying is, whatever I am, and whoever, you know, however I show up, the, the thing is not about it's not about me, God. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready. It's about you being humble and accepting and saying, yes, okay, I'll take you, God. I'll take you, Jesus, as you are, and the way you're showing up in my life. Turn over to Philippians chapter two with me. Let's have a look at a couple of things here, because part of the thing that's so astonishing about this passage is that it says, if we are ready, then it says that the Master becomes the servant. He will serve you. Which is a start. I mean, that's not how society worked in, uh, in the first century in that context, right? Masters don't serve servants. But he says, if you're ready for me, I'm going to sit down and serve you. You're going to have some, some good food with me and I'm going to serve you. Imagine that. Master, servant, servant. But that's Jesus, you see. In Philippians chapter 2 and verses 6 to 7, this is who Jesus is. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be held and used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Taking the very nature of a servant. See, this, this is this thing that's astonishing about Jesus. He comes as a master. But then he lives with us as a servant. I find this mind-boggling. I think as a Christian we take this for granted sometimes. We don't, this is a concept that's completely foreign to the world and completely foreign to all other world religions. A master comes as a master but then lives amongst us as a servant. He became a servant, taking the very nature of a servant, having human likeness. And how do we see this uh, lived out with John 13? Let's go over there. A passage I expect most of us know well. This is perhaps best exemplified in this passage in John 13, in a, in a very shocking way to the disciples. John 13, 3 to 5. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin. And began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel of the wrapped man. Washing his disciples' feet. See, that's our master. If we're ready for the master, we were sharing the joy of him serving us. That's an incredibly revolutionary idea. Now ask this question, let's have a little bit of discussion for a moment. How does Jesus serve us still? And he served us and he came on earth. But how does he continue to serve us? Because it says if the servants are ready for the master, they welcome him in, they're prepared, 
It says, and the master will serve the servants. Now, I think this is God this is coming in as Jesus here. So, how does Jesus still serve us? In what ways are we served by Jesus, even then? What would you say? Well, he intercedes for us, and he keeps it right around the corner. So, he served us when we were and prayed. He's still helping us. Exactly. You know, to move the yeah. He intercedes for us. Yeah. yeah, he has the ear of God the Father. Mm. Excellent. Good, yeah. Just always present. Mm. He's always with us. Yeah. We're never alone yeah. in this world. That's right. Great. Yes. Anything else? How does he still serve us? His words. His words that serve us. Right. Excellent. And that they strengthen us, help us. Yeah. His words serve us. Yes, his teachings. Mm. Yes, yes. Anything his else? Warnings. Sorry. His warnings. His, his warnings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jude. Uh, it's similar to that, but he constantly comforts you with his words and things like that. Okay. It's a, it's a bit like that. Um, yeah. I've got a father figure, but I also got a father figure. Yes. Sir. First, to get those two ideas of the word and the presence of Jesus being with us, that's mm -hmm. a, that he is able to comfort us. Good. Yes. Any other ways he he still serves us? So a couple of other thoughts. Okay. So the spirit is described as the spirit of Christ living in us, right? So in that, with the spirit in us, we are guided by the spirit. We are strengthened by the spirit. We are given strength to uh, to fight temptation, to deal with sin. We're guided. Um, and ultimately, of course, our sins continue to be forgiven. Yeah. Which is another way, I think, in the, in the sense that Jesus serves us. Isn't that amazing? We have a master who serves us. So don't miss out, I think, on this, right? This is the message. Don't miss out on that. Don't take it for granted. Someone talked about being complacent earlier. Don't, let's not be complacent. Let's not take it for granted. He says back in this passage in Luke 12, uh, we've got to be careful because there are burglars out there. I don't want to make any of us nervous right now about what's happening in your house uh, while you're here at church. But uh, uh, he does say that there are burglars, right? Uh, if the thief, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So be ready. Um, I, mean, I don't, don't want to bring up too much trauma again. You have to see Kate. Uh, but uh, have any of us ever been burgled? Been burgled? One, two, three, four of us. Okay, five of them. back. Half the room. Isn't it? It's a bit scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we never had a burglar in a house. Oh, yeah. Just the Christmas thing. Okay. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. I forgot about that one. I do. I do remember that once we parked our car. Uh, there was a church uh, church conference thing back in the eighties again or early nineties, and uh, and I, I had this I had a car like this. Who wow. I had. Who wouldn't do I know it wasn't it, but I'll tell you that was the car. Right <laughs> I had a blue Austin Maxi. Let me just say, it didn't look as nice as that. Um, and it was a, it was a mess. But uh, we went to this conference, and I we had a checkbook. You remember the days of checkbooks? Yeah. We're talking a long time ago. This is days before lots of credit cards and, and touch thingy. What you want to call it? Um, Apple, Apple Pay, Pay and Apple. contactless and stuff you can do through the ether. Suck your money away. Um, before all that, you know, we paid a lot of things by check, right? So I had a checkbook with me, but I didn't want to take it for some reason into the, into the so I put it in the glove box of the car and and left it in the car. And we came back and the door was open. I was like, I don't remember. I think I locked, locked the door. And then I tried to put the key in the ignition, and the key wouldn't go in. And I realised someone had tried to start the car. They snapped off whatever key they were using in the ignition. And then I realised the checkbook was gone. And, uh, and luckily, we didn't lose any money. The bank covered it. It's a bit sad for some people that they wrote checks to that they bought stuff from these things and then they didn't, you know, they had to get the money came back and then they didn't get the money. But uh, it's a bit scary. The Christmas one was terrible. So I save that story for another day. I'll save it for another day. Christmas, <laughs> Christmas, kids and all that. Oh dear, it was Oh, but anyway, so. <laughs> How appropriately inappropriate that would be, yes. Uh, so. Oh, the kids will be in tears. Oh! Being con children. It was Christmas Eve. It was Christmas Eve. It was. I'm really so 
suddenly transported back 20 odd years. That's not telling. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Penny brought it up. I just want to say that. Tell it. Yeah, you say it's It's good. So it was Christmas. I'll tell you the brief story. So um, it was Christmas. We went to Manchester to visit to your mum, and the kids were very small. Fred was only two months old, and Olivia was a year and a half old. So they, and we had we had lots of presents, and a lot of them were from church members for our kids. Really, they weren't out; they were for the kids. And and we had a, a lot. And our kids were young, and it was a time, long time ago, when almost no one in the church had children. So like we were the one of the only two married couples in our part of the church, and maybe there was only one other person with children. So like kids were as special as they always are, but they were just like rare, is what I'm saying. And so they were rare in those days. It's different now. <laughs> it's different now. But in those days they were rare. And people felt like, oh, I want to give your children some presents, and they're little tiny kids. So we we're like, okay, so we had these black bin bags, two or three, full of children's presents for our kids. As well as the ones we bought for them and some other people. And uh, we went to Manchester and we didn't have anywhere to stay. So we stayed in Pete and Sue Botter's house. Some people might know Pete and Sue Botter. Yeah. And we stayed in their house. They were away, so they gave us a key and that was fine. And we uh, went and stayed in the house. We went out one day and then came back and someone had murdered the house. They broke into the window, got in, and they'd taken all the children's toys. Already packed up. All right. <laughs> 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 right, they were in there. <laughs> They were in black bin line, it was perfect. They just had to pick it and take it with them. So uh, it was uh, the, the fortunate thing was our children were so young, they had no idea. Yeah. They didn't register. So we went out to uh, Argos or somewhere. Woolworths, that was it. In the days when Woolworths existed. There you go. We're dating ourselves again and again. Yeah. And we bought a ton of other stuff the best we could and it was okay kind of. But it was oh, it's one of those things you don't forget. And uh, it was awful. And uh, it, this idea of losing something precious mm. is something we mustn't take for granted. We've been given the Messiah. He's come as a master, but he lives amongst us as a servant. How amazing. And if any of us haven't yet come to know the master in this way, and don't know him yet as a servant, wouldn't now in our lives be the best time to take advantage of that? Whether you're young or older, we need to take the opportunity when it comes, because that's respectful towards what God is doing in our life. So that's our first point, is uh, not to miss out on the master. The second is to not misuse his servants. I think that's the message of the second part here. Um, the faithful and wise manager, the master puts him in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance. So it's quite important. It's not just bonus luxury stuff, it's actually their food. It will be good. For that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. That's wrong. Good. Promotion is on offer. A servant says to himself, yeah, he's taken a long time coming. He begins to beat the other servants, men and women, to eat and drink and get drunk. And then what's going to happen when the master comes back is he's going to be cut into pieces and assigned a place with the unbelievers. That's pretty scary. Right there. That doesn't do of all the things that Jesus said, um, there might not be anything scarier than, than this bit here. And it comes as a response to Peter asking the question that everybody else is, is thinking. Is this about us or about somebody else? Isn't it? I really love Peter. He's like, who's this about? Us or other people? Well, it seems that it is about us. It is about Peter and the disciples. And it is about us, the servants of the Master. That we must not abuse other people. I think what came to me from this is just the question of whether I'm eager to serve others or eager to serve myself. Mm -hmm. Where is my eagerness level in life? Eager to serve, serve others or eager to serve myself? And the servant that's put in charge, becomes a master, ends up becoming eager to serve himself. Um, he beats up the men and the women. I think that's an allusion to the Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant prophets and what Israel did to the prophets that came when they were killed. Jesus talks about that in the Gospel of Luke. But I think the application is broader than that. So, let me ask us for our collective wisdom here. Let's try applying this to our, our modern day circumstances. What would be the equivalent of us as servants of Jesus amongst other servants of Jesus? So we're talking, I think, here primarily about our interchurch fellowship life. 
What would be the equivalent for us of beating each other up? I haven't seen any physical violence in this congregation yet. Um, but uh, what would be the equivalent of beating each other up, taking each other's, or taking the food away, getting drunk? Uh, but how, what might be an application? What might be a way that we would be in danger of abusing our privilege, of misusing uh, the servants of the master? What do you think? Any ideas? Yes, Simon. We could be <coughs> judgmental, critical of each other, we could say bad things to each other, or okay. gossip. Like All right. Yeah, yeah. Judgmental and negative about one another. Yeah, good. Charles. So we probably often um, treat our closest family in the worst. Okay. Like, different than you would treat someone else. So I think we can think about the you know, comments and things that I would say to my wife and the way that I react to my child sometimes. It's not something I would do necessarily to, to people here. Yeah, it's not my family. Um, yet that's my wife and my child are probably closest to me and to the service. Okay, so it's also about what's going on at home. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Good, okay. Any other ideas? Do you think about being the opposite of love? So being, um, mm. not thinking the best of people. Mm. Not, not thinking the best of people. Not looking so good. In what others are doing, whatever they're doing, wherever they come from. Good. Uh, somebody said to me that amongst Christians, we should always be our first, our first reaction to seeing or hearing something we not, we doesn't look good, is we should always give another Christian the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Not meaning we shouldn't talk to them or get engaged in the situation, but that we should always, to begin with, say that probably looks, it looks bad, but maybe it isn't as bad as it looks. I don't know. No. But giving each other the benefit. Of I think it's a, a healthy thing to do rather than rush to judgment with science. Leon? Uh, what help we need in the UK? Okay, uh, that's very much in this passage, not doing what we could help someone when we actually know there is something we could do. Yeah. Being dishonest in business dealings, perhaps with other. Mm. Mm -hmm. and business, borrowing things, not returning them. In the in the in the uh, state in which we borrow them, uh, repaying a debt, maybe. I've just reminded myself, telling you that I owe somebody five pounds. <laughs> Not here in Thames Valley. Going to see him on Friday. Okay, I must remember. Give Tony his five pounds back. It's on camera, so I must. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let no yeah. debt remain outstanding, yeah, right? Except the debt, the blood. So, okay. I we're dealing there with an opinion matter, which is slightly different. Okay. Uh, I mean, we can assault one another's kindness and grace and patience by outstaying our welcome with one another or, or talking at one another rather than listening, talking a lot rather than asking questions. Uh, we can gossip, slander. Uh, not speak the truth in love. That comes back to what you said, I think, Liam, about saying, you know, what can we do now? We can see a way we can speak the truth in love and we don't do it. Taking our spouse for granted. Uh, taking, our, taking our parents for granted. Younger people, perhaps. Um, with, withholding, withholding love for one another when it's needed. And the drunkenness issue here, it talks about this chap getting drunk, overindulging in things that are not necessarily bad and evil in themselves, alcohol, wine, or beer, or something is not a bad thing in itself, but taking too much and serving self rather than others. I think the passage that came to my mind with this is Titus 2, verse 11 to 14. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people and teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, important phrase at the end, eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is good. It's, it's a wonderful thing that in this passage, in this passage it says that if the master finds the manager doing what he's meant to be doing, it says that he will, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. In other words, we get to inherit something. There's something about doing the right thing for God that, that, that guarantees our inheritance of, 
I don't quite fully get the connections exactly, but there's something about that that it assures us of good things to come. We can do good for one another. We can do good to one another. And God gets the honor, but I think we also get the encouragement. We get to share more in who Christ is somehow by living like Him. We become more like Him, but there's also something about sharing in what matters to Him that draws us closer to Him. And I think creates the more that fullness of life that Christ offers, life to the full. We've got many opportunities to do that. We'll finish off and take some communion here in a moment. We don't we'll have to skip a couple of things. But let's finish off with Mark chapter 10 here. In Mark 10, we have, we have Jesus stating something that's very important to who he is and his approach to his role and um, his time on earth, but I think even beyond that. And in Mark 10, after, um, uh, after some problems between the disciples, James and John and others, Jesus calls them together in verse 42, and he says, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, see that phrase, Son of Man, that's back in our passage in Luke 12, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom. That's our master who serves us. That's our master who lives amongst us as a servant. That's our master who's granted us responsibilities and privileges such that we can <coughs> serve others motivated by the grace that we've been given. So I think the question for us is, are we in danger of missing out? Are we in danger of missing out on coming to know the master who serves us? Are we taking the opportunities to read the Bible, study it, pray with people here, to come to know, to ask one another here more about that Jesus? about the master who served, we're missing out. And secondly, let's not misuse his service. I like us as a fellowship here. Let's make sure that we are living a life of love, love together. I don't say this because I feel that this is a group that doesn't generally love one another uh, effectively in a Christ-like way. I only say it because it's in the passage. And something that's in the passage is something we need to say to one another from time to time. And so perhaps, it, I don't know if it's a group thing or just a, for, for us personally, you know, somebody here, who's been struggling with this, this eagerness to serve others. If we're struggling with that eagerness, well, why don't we see if we can find some help together to get that eagerness back. Praying together, reading the Bible together, talking as friends together, to find this eagerness motivated by the grace of God because he came amongst us to serve as a ransom for many. We are very privileged. And we're privileged now to take some bread and wine. And this celebrates and uh, commemorates what Jesus did and is a, a reminder of what he did for us, that he came to die and be a ransom for us as a servant, as a ransom for many. So what, let's pray together, and then we'll take some bread and wine, prayerfully, that will refresh us. Let's pray.